You know that moment when you're a background character listening to some sort of important announcement? Maybe it's about Emperor Alliances or Warlord Dissolutions, it doesn't matter, the standard day-to-day -day Marine stuff, but then you stop and realize that you are a hamburger, like a literal hamburger. At which point you are filled with this overwhelming sense of existential dread. And so you just need to stop and ask yourself, why? Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we are back to place a comically large microscope across the span of One Piece to discover some truly mind-blowing details about the series that I can guarantee most of you will have missed. And why can I guarantee that? Well, because even I, a man who has honestly nothing better to do except read and reread and even re-reread the series over and over again, well, even I missed a lot of these things the first few times around. There is just so much to take in with this series that many profound background details get overlooked entirely. But as you'll soon discover, it is very much worth diving into things a little bit deeper. Before that though, it's time for a quick round of Major or Minor, a very simple mini game, the rules of which are as follows. Inside of this here box is a One Piece character and your job is to guess whether that character will be a major or a minor character. Major characters being defined as our primary protagonist, antagonist, etc., whilst minor characters are best defined as something like, I don't know, this drawing of Fishman Nami. And if you guess incorrectly, then your envious punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will also result in regular One Piece content being uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. And if you are correct, then you may reward yourself with a candy of your choosing. But what will this character be, major or minor? Choose now and we shall reveal the answer in three, two, one, and bam, it is the dirt boss from Gadatsu's cover story, who in addition to being a minor character, also happens to be a professional minor with an E, so there's like this pun thing happening. But if you picked major, then you know the thing it is that you need to do. Hit the button and please do comment down below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet, welcome. But for our first mind-blowing detail, I actually want to return to this drawing of Fishman Nami, because you are not going to believe this. This was originally a goofy little gag thing that happened at the dawn of One Piece. At the time, Sanji was being Sanji, wondering if the reason why Nami was so lovely is because she may have been a mermaid and Luffy was being Luffy by bringing that sheer artistic vision to life. It's a fantastic throwaway comic moment from the early days of the series. However, let's skip forward ahead about 13 years of publication to chapter 626. A primarily tragic installment involving Otohime actually, but in our one moment of victory, what do we have here? If we look closely at this crowd shot, yes, we see Fishman Nami brought to life in all of her bizarre simplistic glory. And actually, you know, come to think of it, since this was a flashback, I think that means that Fishman Nami canonically predates Luffy's drawing, and thus I feel like Fishman Nami could sue Luffy for aquatic plagiarism. Sadly, however, Fishman Nami did not make it into the anime adaptation for uh, no good reason, especially since they went ahead and animated Squidhead. Ah, I mean, seriously, Squidhead got in, but Fishman Nami did not. This process, is a sham. However, what makes up for this is that you can actually vote for Fishman Nami in the world top 100 character poll, so go forth and do with that mind-blowing detail whatever you will. Let's move away from fish for a second though and onto a man who no doubt smells like putrid fish. It is of course, Wapol. And our mind-blowing detail regarding him is that Wapol is technically responsible for the entire existence of General Frankie. How is that possible, you ask? Frankie and Wapol, hey, well, they've never met and that is actually true, but you have gravely underestimated of Wapol's capacity to fail upwards. After being unceremoniously expelled from Drum Island, Wapol was left to fend for himself on a street in a location that I can only describe as somewhere. And due to eating almost exclusively garbage, Wapol accidentally created an entirely new metal compound that went on to completely revolutionize global engineering and was thereby dubbed Wapo Metal. And it's only because of Wapo Metal that Frankie was able to build the gargantuan beast that is General Frankie, because it allows metal to kind of morph and change shapes. So basically we have Wapol to thank for General Frankie as well as many of Frankie's other great inventions. And it doesn't even end there though because Wapo metal is now such a prominent substance that it is being used by leading world scientists, including those of the Germa kingdom. The Germa raid suits now incorporate Wapo metal into their functionality. So in a weird way, Sanji also has Wapol to thank for his latest power up. Which means that two straw hats have now significantly benefited from one of the most hated characters in this entire series, so. 
Yay, Wapple. Speaking of the German though, here's a detail that made my mind kind of melt when it was first pointed out to me, but Sanji's mother is named Sora. Now that in and of itself is not mind melt appropriate. However, in an intriguing parallel, Sora is also the name of the main character of the comic strip published in the World Economic Times. Sora, warrior of the sea, a marine hero who notably battles the fictional armies of the Germa double six, which is quite striking because Sanji's mother Sora, despite being a member of the Germa, was in direct opposition opposition to their ideals and goals, just like the Sora from the comic strip. So there's this very subtle story being told here through fiction within fiction, although where Sora, Warrior of the Sea, was quite successful in repelling the drama, Sora, mother of Sanji, saw much less grandiose success, although her ideals are now survived by her son. Which, I don't know. Through Inherited Will, does that make Sanji our new Warrior of the Sea protagonist? I mean, I can see it right now. Sanji, Okama Warrior of the Sea. Sanji is far from the only straw hat who has inherited aspects of their maternal figures though, and we now turn to Robin for a pretty incredible detail. So if you've seen my video detailing Robin's true bounty, I made the claim that her initial bounty of 79 million berries was a bit of an arbitrary number, but as it turns out, that's not entirely true. Robin's child bounty is actually a direct replica of her mother mother's Nico Olvia. Prior to her untimely and unfortunate death, Olvia also had a bounty of 79 million berries. And so when the world government were, I guess, discussing what number to assign Robin, it would seem that she basically inherited her mother's threat level and was slapped with that 79 million. Not the greatest of things to inherit, I must admit. I mean, I would have rather this, you know, some nice property, but yeah, you know, uh, an infamous bounty, I guess. At least it's nice connective tissue back to her mother. Also, while we're here, I do need to admit that for a short shockingly large majority of my life, I had no idea that Robin's mother's name was Olvia. For whatever reason, I had always read her name as Nico Olivia. I thought that was reasonable. I didn't need to question my eyes. However, when I did eventually find out that there was no second eye and that her name was Olvia, well, that was... <sighs> That was a legitimate mind blow for me. Running with the theme of seemingly arbitrary bounties now, have any of you ever looked at Charlotte Katakuri's bounty and asked yourselves, why one billion and 57 million berries? Why not just cap him at a flat one billion? At that point, what does the extra 57 million even do? Well, functionally, nothing, but narratively, everything. As it turns out, this 57 million is actually far more important than the whole 1 billion aspect. And to explain why, we first need to take a look at Luffy. If you've spent a decent amount of time with One Piece, then you will have noticed that he has a trademark number, which is 56. It occasionally appears on various items of clothing and such, because these numbers can be read as Gomu in Japanese, which replicates the name of Luffy's devil fruit, the Gomu Gomu no Mi. So when it comes to Katakuri, whose entire idea was that he was the superior of Luffy in every way, having a very similar ability, only much more better, well, what's a better way to show that than to make Katakuri's trademark number 57. Thus, one-upping Luffy's 56. It's an almost frustratingly clever minor detail, and it shows that very little in One Piece is actually arbitrary and meaningless, even if it does appear that way. Oh, and as a Katakuri bonus fact, many people overlook this, but he is actually a triplet. He was born in what we'll call the same batch of spawn as both Charlotte Oven and Charlotte Daifuku, thus making them all 48 years old, and also making them an entire pack of middle-aged men who still live with their mother. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, sometimes the economy is just in a bad place and you gotta, you gotta live with mom. I'm a millennial, I understand. But you know what is very, very wrong though? Well, that would be anthropomorphic swords. So here's a fun detail that you will find buried in a mountain of SBS segments within the manga, but Oda actually has a habit of drawing objects as if they were people. And three primary victims of this artwork consist of the swords Wadawichi Monji, Sanda Kitetsu, and Shusui, all pictured here from left to right in all of their, um, I, I don't know what you would call this. I do know that glory is the wrong word though. You know, you got Wado looking quite nice and chilled, and then Shusui on the far right, looking very refined like the upstairs Standing black blade he is, but then in the middle we have this sneaky Sandai Kitetsu just looking for trouble, which makes sense since it is a cursed blade and all. What makes this so much better though is that just like Fisherman Army, you can vote for all of these personified swords in the World Top 100 character poll. So at the very least, I suppose these three stooges are now canon characters which is still more than we can say for Condoriano, so hmm. On the topic of swords now, this is a ridiculous detail that is far too buried and nowhere near widespread enough, but you may remember that during Wano, Hitetsu mentioned a man by the name of Shimotsuki Kozaburo, a man who was responsible for crafting Zoro's Wadawichi Monji, as well as Kozuki Odin's Enma, which I must stress is not the same thing as Kozuki Odin's Enma. I have no idea if Kozaburo was involved in that, I mean, for his sake. 
I hope not. And whilst this has not been mentioned in the series itself as of yet, but Oda has confirmed in an SBS segment that Kozaburo is the one who left Wano 55 years ago with several other citizens and eventually ended up in East Blue founding Shimotsuki Village, which is where Zoro grew up. In addition to this, Oda also flat out confirmed that Kozaburo is the father of Koshiro, Zoro Sensei, and the grandfather of Kuina, Zoro's key rival and inspiration. And while it was not confirmed if Zoro himself is descended from Wano or not, he did know Kozaburo sort of. Zoro referred to him as an old geezer in the village who taught him the Sunachi term, which is particularly fascinating because in the current day, Zoro has also inherited Enma, another blade crafted by Kozaburo. And in a way, he's kind of the rightful descendant to Enma as well, so hmm. Given that Zoro is carrying on Kozaburo's grandfather's dream, it only makes sense that he would inherit another Kozaburo blade. So that is an absolutely wild detail that you will currently not find in either the anime or the manga. For something that spans both now, who remembers this girl? She was quite prominently featured post Whole Cake Island in a chapter where the Revolutionary Army commanders help the people of the Lelucia Kingdom in order to fend off the Peachbeard Pirates. In fact, this girl, this one right here, is ultimately responsible for defeating Captain Peachbeard himself. She is far from a random character though, and her name is actually Moda, who we first met 15 years prior to her appearance in this chapter. Moda was a key figure in Ace's cover story, first introduced all the way back in chapter 278, and is actually responsible for saving Ace's life, albeit in a very comical kind of way. But this entire cover story turned into a a sort of quest for Ace to deliver a letter from Moda to a Marine Vice Admiral, ultimately resulting in Moda supplying the Marines with much needed milk. It's a very cute story with quite a sweet ending, which is why seeing her village invaded two years later is actually, uh, it's a bit harrowing. But at the same time, it's a very cool callback for manga fans. I mean, sadly, most of our cover stories were never animated. So anime only watches are just, they, uh, they just sort of stumble upon this random milk bearing girl, which reminds me, milk, milk. Milky. Despite the fact that Oda isn't really all that keen on some of the old romance in One Piece, occasionally some does slip in here and there. And a very canon pairing that is currently developing would be that of Chopper and the mink Milky. Milky is the only character that Chopper has shown any real interest in. And on the color spread for chapter 900, you can see him sort of meekishly about to offer her a rose, which is adorable. And I can certainly imagine Chopper retiring to Zoe at the end of the series after having cured all disease everywhere and just having many, many any young chopperlings. For a more global perspective now, I honestly cannot believe how long it took me to notice this, but have you ever considered that none of the four emperors are ever actually referred to as pirate captains? They are captain figures of their own pirate crews, but that title just doesn't really get used internally. Shanks happens to be called the boss or the big boss of the red hair pirates. Marshal D. Teach is labeled as either the Commodore or the Admiral of the Blackbeard Pirates, depending on your translation. Whilst Kaido is the Governor General of the Beast Pirates. And Big Mom is usually referred to as the Queen or simply Mama by her family members. Furthermore, our dearly departed Emperor Whitebeard was always called Pops by his crew, all of which is a very interesting trend and quite appropriately implemented. Because I suppose the idea is that these key pirates have surpassed that basic seafaring hierarchical structure to the point where the captain role is a bit too understated because they are now effectively the rulers of their own empires. I mean, you know, we wouldn't call Cobra captain of Alabaster. He's the king of Alabaster. I mean, provided he isn't dead, which uh, he very well could be. But even if he was dead, we still wouldn't call him a captain because he was a king, not a captain we couldn't call him a captain when he's a king. It's ridiculous. Which does raise the question, what will Luffy's title be when his empire is equal to that of theirs? Well, I'm going to put in a preemptive vote for Chieftain Executive Skipper Luffy Esquire, Eater of Meat, Breaker of Faces, Lord of the Grand Line. But if you'd like to see more mind-blowing details in One Piece, then please do check out my original video exploring the topic, lots of crazy stuff in there. But please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join the discussion on my Discord server. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.